we've been living in a spiritual haze, limiting our faith to church on Sundays. Some of us are so busy trying to win a fight that we have forgotten Jesus told us to be the light. The people of God are called to serve, though often we find ourselves reserved, unaware of the lost we pass by every day, not spreading the light, the truth, and the way. At times, our fears leave us frozen, stopping us from pursuing God's chosen. God gives us the strength every day to love those who have gone astray, lifting up the weak when we are strong, forgiving those who have done us wrong. The family of God makes a son out of the orphan. We stand up for those who have been forgotten. The people of God stand together in unity, finding strength in times of uncertainty. All of God's people have been set free. Together, we can live in victory. Amen. I was thinking as I was watching that with you that uh, that that could be the sermon, right? We could just say, okay, now go and do what that video said and church is dismissed, except uh, that would mean that some folks t tuned in for nothing in their minds and f folks came for nothing and we don't want you to do that. We want you to come. And I prepared for nothing and I have, have a message God's given me of hope today that we believe we all need and uh, we're going to do our country, of course, has been torn apart. We want to welcome the people that are with us on Facebook Live. Uh, we've been torn apart this past week and uh, are more divided probably than we have been in, in a long, long time. And uh, I wanted to just reiterate this morning the, the truth of the Bible, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus loved the, loves the little children. You know that song for Sunday school? All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. We believe that. And we are thankful that God's given us the opportunity to reach uh, people of various ethnic backgrounds. It doesn't matter what race you are in because you're a member of the human race. And God made us all in his image, didn't he? And uh, despite all of the turmoil and all of the uh, divided divisiveness of our nation, we wanted to just remind everyone that we are to be one nation under God. And there's no better, way, no better way in my mind to do that besides making statements than to use the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And so what we'd like to do is uh, this morning, one of our uh, church members who's a vet is going to lead us in the Pledge of the Flag. And those that are here, if you want to stand with me, we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, and then we're going to sing our opening song. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. And uh, we thank God for America. America is far from perfect. We're not a perfect nation, uh, but we are a nation uh, under God. We have in God we trust on our coins, don't we? In God we trust. And we need to practice what we say we believe on our coins and uh, try to trust in God and his amazing grace. That's the song that we're going to start with this morning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It's the same tune and the same words, a little different uh, arrangement. But I think that you'll enjoy that and uh, sing along with us as we sing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that 
seen the movie Amazing Grace. If you haven't seen that movie yet, I I'm, I'm strongly recommend that to you. Uh, it's the story of the man who wrote that song. His name was John Newton and William Wilberforce. Now, some people know of Newton's name, John Newton, but they don't know William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce is the gentleman in England that worked for 40 plus years in the English Parliament to stop slavery. Many of the members of Parliament owned slave ships and made lots of money off the slave trade. 
And many people thought that was impossible to ever get that to end because of that. And William Wilberforce did not give up. He kept on keeping on. He was friends with John Newton. John Newton, the man that wrote Amazing Grace, he had been a either captain or a crew member of a slave ship. His life was a life of dissipation and just terrible wickedness. And God saved him miraculously from the slave trade, from making his money off of selling human beings. And he, he be, stopped that and he became friends with, I'm not sure you have to watch the movie of how he became friends with William Wilberforce, but it's a great story of that man's conversion and also how William Force persisted and persisted and persisted. Just imagine how you would age in 40 years. <laughs> think of that. Think, think of how, you know, if he, if he started when he was 25, it means six took him to 65. And I don't know what the ages were exactly, but I'm just trying to give you a comparison. See? And he kept at it. He kept at it. And finally, it was done. It was accomplished. And uh, that lets me know that there's nothing that cannot be accomplished that's a righteous cause when God's people will pray and persevere and keep on keeping on. And uh, there are a lot of parallels to America, a lot of parallels to the abortion industry and all those things, but you can make your own, uh, uh, hopefully, applications of that. But we thank God uh, for the opportunity that we have as a church to help uh, the Capital Area Pregnancy Center. They're in the middle of their baby bottle blast. And uh, we thank the Lord. We've so far uh, received $145 for, toward this. And we're going to continue this through the month of June. Now, when you come to the building, if you want to give a, a gift to that, just take one of the yellow envelopes that are at the back that are kind of for special offerings, and you can put your cash or your uh, check in there. Uh, you make the checks out to Capital Bible Church. Uh, if you give online, be sure that you just note to us that it's for Baby Bottle Blast, and we'll be sure to see that the Capital Area Pregnancy Center gets it, all right? Um, but we appreciate those of you that have given both online and here at the church and those that continue to give to support the ministry. Uh, God's faithful. Nobody knows when the pandemic is going to be over, but, but God, see, God knows. And uh, God is in control all the time, even when you don't see him working. God's always working. And I thank the Lord for the people who are giving. Uh, God's been faithful to meet the needs, and we're continuing to support our missionaries around the world and here at home. Uh, Mount Lusanne Bible Camp is a ministry we support, and I would encourage you to pray for them. Uh, Mount Lusanne Bible Camp, uh, for the first time in all of its years, has had to cancel its overnight program just because of all the regulations and everything that's going on with this uh, pandemic. However, they are able to run day camps, and uh, I got an email last night uh, from Brother Artie Parlin, who said that uh, the day camps are going to run in the month of July. Most of them are already booked and full, so uh, that's a great, a great opportunity to reach boys and girls in day camp. Their parents will bring them in the morning and then pick them up uh, sometime late afternoon, but the staff has the opportunity not only to have them in games and in physical activities, but teaching the Bible. So I'll uh, share that with you and ask you to pray for them. The staff's not come back yet. The staff was sent home uh, when this all hit, and they, they hope to bring the staff back uh, sometime the middle of June. So just continue to pray for Mount Lusanne Bible Camp and Encounter Revival Ministries. A couple other prayer requests I want to share with our regular church family. And if you're watching this morning, I appreciate those of you who Give a comment in the comment section as to where you're watching. That helps us to know and helps us to, uh, to chart how, how effective our uh, online uh, video ministry is. So if you could do that for us sometime today, just uh, put in the comments where you're watching. That's a great help. But please pray for these folks that are in the hospital. Laura Reitler's mother, uh, her name is Inga Reitler. Uh, I call her Mrs. Inga Reitler Sr., uh, she's in the hospital and uh, struggling 
keep her in prayers, please. Also, uh, Mike Gilberg, uh, Mary Ellen's husband, Mike Gilberg, was taken to the VA hospital uh, with cognitive, cognitive heart failure. Mary Ellen asked if we would pray for her husband, Mike. So please remember those two folks that are in the hospital. And uh, then here's a praise, Marie Brady, who many of you have been praying for. She was uh, released and allowed to go home from rehab after many, many weeks in rehab after surgery. So she's at home. Uh, she texted me last night and said, thank the church family for all their prayers. I feel a lot stronger now having come through rehab. And uh, she's praising the Lord for his faithfulness and for your prayers for her. So uh, she thanked us for all of that. We're going to continue to pray for our country that God will bring revival to our land, that America will get the wake-up call, recognize we need God. We desperately need God as a nation. Let's look to the Lord together now and believe in prayer as we remember these requests. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for America. America is uh, definitely blessed by you. And we thank you for the way that you have protected our country, our nation, from uh, from attack, from invaders, from uh, foreign troops in the last couple hundred years not being here on American soil. We've never been invaded uh, by military forces. Now we are being invaded by all kind of uh, evil, and there's evil that abounds and wickedness abounds, and we know that you've said in your word that uh, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin and evil is a reproach to any people. So I would pray for America right now that America would recognize that there are people that are, their sole agenda is not to help anybody, but it's to destroy this nation, to destroy uh, Bible morality, destroy American values. Uh, we know that America needs a lot of help. So I pray that America would repent of their sins and we would all recognize that we need to examine ourselves, not just point fingers at others. But I pray that we would have enough people who would humble themselves and pray and seek your face and confess our sins so you would hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land. I pray for uh, the president, the vice president, pray for the members of Congress, the Supreme Court, help them all to recognize that despite their political differences, that they uh, govern by your divine permission, and that one day they'll give an account to you for how they governed. And so I pray that leaders would make decisions based upon that which is right and decent and good, not just political expediency. And I would ask for the men and women in the military, watch over them and keep them safe. And I pray for our law enforcement officials and uh, those that are on the front lines battling the pandemic. There's still people that are dying from the virus. I pray for doctors and nurses that you would uh, protect them. And I pray for wisdom uh, as our country seeks to reopen and seeks to get the economy uh, moving again. We ask that you would pour out your blessings upon our nation because our nation seeks to do what's right for peoples uh, of all races. And we thank you that you love the world. And you don't just love America, you love the world. So help us to understand biblical truth and help us to recognize that we need to stand for that which is right and good always and not fear political consequences. Help us to recognize that the, the gospel in the Bible is not political. Thank you that you love the whole world. Thank you that you are one day going to give us a new heaven and a new earth. And that the Prince of Peace, Jesus, will reign and rule here on the earth for a thousand years. Until that time, help us to be uh, willing to stand for truth and speak the truth in love and show your love to one another. I do pray for these folks in the hospital. We pray for uh, Inga Reitler Sr. Uh, I ask that you would uh, just in a special way minister healing to her. I pray for her daughters, uh, that you would, Loretta, and Lorraine, Lisa, and Laura, that you would comfort them and, and meet their needs and the needs of the family. And I pray that uh, Inga would feel the prayers of her church family. And we ask also for Mike Gilberg at the VA hospital. I pray that you would 
protect him from uh, the plague as well as Inga and uh, help his heart that is given lots of trouble here recently. Pray you'd strengthen his heart. We thank you that Marie Brady is home from the hospital for your goodness to her. And now I would ask for our church and all churches where the gospel is preached. I pray that we would not lose sight of our mission, which is to give the gospel to the whole world. Uh, that great commission is still in effect. And regardless of any kind of government restrictions, we are thankful we can preach the gospel and give your word, give your truth. So as it goes out today uh, across the internet and uh, through live services, I pray that wherever Jesus Christ is lifted up, that he would draw all people to himself as he said he would. We thank you for your promise that your word will not return to you empty, but will accomplish the purposes for which it's sent. So we give you praise and thanks that you are working and you're going to keep on working. And I pray that we would keep on looking to you and keep trusting you and not be afraid. We thank you that we, through the comfort of the scriptures, can have hope. Help us to understand how to get that in our lives so that we don't give in to despair and to fear and anxiety and all the terrible negative emotions that drag people down. I ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior, with thanksgiving. Amen. Well, we've been in a series called Here's Hope. Here's Hope. And if there's anything that our people need today, it's hope, isn't it? People, people need hope. People need hope. And uh, we have looked at several applications of this subject. Today we're going to talk about hope lost and found. Hope lost and found. Now there's always a big idea that we try to get across, and that's so that if a person re doesn't remember anything about the sermon, they can remember this, all right? So uh, there's one thing, if you, have to, if you can only remember one thing, then Remember this, please. Here's the big idea. Human beings have no hope without God. Say that with me, please, out loud. Human beings have no hope without God. One more time. Human beings have no hope without God. Now, for those of you that are watching online, let me encourage you to don't just be a spectator. Uh, when we ask you to say something, say something. Uh, and you say, well, that's dumb because you can't hear me. Well, I understand that, but God hears, and uh, if you want us to hear you, then just put it in the comment section, all right? But get your Bible, too, and follow along, because it's always helpful to know uh, that the preacher is preaching God's Word, not just giving his opinion. It would not be worth it for me to come here every week and give my opinion. I'm sorry, my opinion is not worth it, all right? It's not worth my getting up. It's not my worth taking the time to... Uh, just prepare a message that's my opinion. It's not my opinion that matters. It's what God says, all right? And so notice in Ephesians 2.12. Ephesians 2.12 talks about people who have no hope and are without God in the world. And that's sadly a vast, vast, vast majority of the world. They have no hope. They're without God. So if you want to give people hope, you've got to point them to God. You point them to God. That's why, do you know why the Bible, do you know what the first sentence of the Bible is? First four words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And the problem today in all levels of the culture, both in America and other cultures of the world, is that people grow up not knowing about God. People have worshipped gods of science, gods of education, gods of entertainment, gods of sports, right? Well, all those gods have failed us during this virus, haven't they? Yeah, all those gods have failed us. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to have education and it's wrong to have science and sports and entertainment. I'm just saying that's, you don't make a God out of that. See? You start with God. And by the way, all, all science, true science and true education and true knowledge starts with God. Starts with God. Now, 
what we need today is we need people who understand that you can believe in the Bible and believe in God and you can still use your brain. You don't have to park your brain at the door to believe the Bible. Some people say, well, you know, you Christians, you have, you have to have all that faith, but we have all these facts. Oh, that's baloney. We have facts too. See? And the problem is that people's truth and, and watch this. Today, for most, the most part, many people believe that truth is relative. What do I mean by that? Well, they mean it depends on the situation. It's what they used to call situational ethics, right? That it would depend upon, it would depend upon your situation. It might be okay for you to steal food from the store if you're, if you're hungry. That's situational ethics. It's not okay to steal food from the store if you're hungry, all right? It's wrong to steal. God said in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, period. Thou shalt not murder, period. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, period. And here's a sad reality. If America would just practice the Ten Commandments, we could get rid of a lot of the crime, a lot of the disease, a lot of everything that we have in the land, wouldn't it? Just Ten Commandments. And that's just, you know, first couple books of the Bible. So hope. Hope is very important. I read a funny story about a man who told his doctor he didn't know what was wrong with him, but himself, but he wasn't able to do all the things around the house he used to do. He said, Doc, I need you to tell me what's the matter. And when the examination was complete, he said, Now, Doc, I can take it. Tell me what's wrong with me in plain English. And if I smile a lot this morning, it's because we have, of course, a doc in our church, don't we? I can take it. Tell me what is wrong with me in plain English. The doctor said in plain English, you're just lazy. <laughs> the man said, okay, now give me the medical terms so I can tell my wife. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes we find ourselves physically knowing something's wrong, but we don't know what the problem is. The same thing can be true emotionally. At times we find ourselves emotionally drained, but we really do not know what the problem is. Now, many times, the reason we find ourselves like this is because we have lost all hope. And so today I want to talk with you briefly about why hope is lost and when hope is lost, and then hope found okay where's hope found so let's talk first of all with why hope is lost open your bibles to first kings 19 first kings 19 we have a great illustration of why hope is lost in the life of elijah now before we get to chapter 19 we have an amazing story in chapter 18 and I have preached already messages on this, on 1 Kings chapter 18. And in 1 Kings 18, 20, Ahab sent for all the children and gathered all the prophets together on Mount Carmel. Now, there were 850 false prophets, 850. How do I know that? Because verse 19 says, Gather together all Israel on Mount Carmel, 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, that's the goddess of fertility or the sex goddess, who eat at Jezebel's table. So there were 850 false prophets. We know that again from verse 19. And Elijah dared them. He, he challenged them, that's a better word, to meet him on the top of Mount Carmel. And he said, we're going to see who God, the, the real God is. And in verse 21 of chapter 18, Elijah said, how long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And it says the people answered him not a word. They didn't know what to say. See, he challenged them. He said, how long are you going to try to keep sitting on the fence? How long are you going to waver? Between two opinions. If God is God, follow him. If he's not, then follow the other gods. 
people didn't know what to say to that. They didn't answer. So then Elijah said, look, I alone am left the prophet of the Lord. Now, here, here I want to show you something about Elijah, because this, this gets to what we're going to go to when the next chapter. Elijah thought that he was the only one who was serving God. You ever feel that way? Well, that's false. Okay. That's false. Elijah was not the only one serving God. Now, those of you who, who are Bible students who know the rest of the Elijah's story, I'm going to ask you, how many people did God say he had left that were serving him that did not bow the knee to Baal? How many? 7,000, right. 7,000. God spoke to Elijah later in the next chapter. He said, Elijah, I don't know why you're, I don't know why you're so in despair. There are, I have 7,000 in the country who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Sometimes I think that Americans feel like and believers feel like, well, I'm the only one serving God. That's not true. That's not true. Sadly, sometimes there are lots of people around who are serving God, but they don't want to speak out. They're afraid, right? Elijah, here on Mount Carmel, he says to the false prophets, he says, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a challenge. We're going to see who the real God is. So I want you to put, we're going we're gonna to pray. We're going to have a, a prayer duel. What we're going to do is we're going to make two altars out of stone. We're going to put wood on the altars, and we're going to put a sacrifice, an animal that will We'll kill and put on the altar. And then you call on the name of your God. You pray. You, you go first. I'll give you first, first dibs on this. And you pray and you ask Baal and your gods to light the fire on that altar. And to make that burnt offering. And then when you're all done, then I'll pray and call on the name of Jehovah God. The God that answers by fire, he's God. And finally... Finally, the people said, it's well spoken. Yeah, that's good. We agree with that. So that's what they did. The Bible says from morning till noon. This is chapter 18. You can read this when you're a little bit later. From morning till noon, the prophets of Baal cried. And they yelled, yelled out, Baal, hear us. And they finally, they, 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 ripped, they whipped themselves into a demonic frenzy. And I use those words on purpose. And cut themselves with knives. They slashed themselves with knives, trying to get the attention of their false god. And nothing happened. They did it all day long. And finally, Elijah said, okay, that's long enough. Now it's my turn. And in verse 33, it says in chapter 18, he put the wood in order. And cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and the wood. Four water pots with water. Why would you put water on wood that you're trying to light a fire? And he didn't just put four water pots. He said to him, do it again. Do it again. Three times. So they've had how many buckets of water? Twelve. Twelve pots of water. Elijah wanted them to see that Jehovah God, there was nothing impossible for him. And then he prayed. How much faith do you think it took for Elijah to put the water on that fire, well, even if he didn't put water on the fire, how much faith? 850 against one. But then he made it worse by putting the water on the fire, okay? On the wood. And then he, pr he cried out. He said, hear me, O Lord, hear me. Verse 37. That this people may know that you are the Lord God and you have turned their hearts back to you again. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust 
and licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, the Lord is God. The Lord is God. And Elijah said to the people, all right, grab the prophets of Baal. Don't let one of them escape. And so they grabbed the false prophets, and they brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. So 850 false prophets lost their lives because they could not get fire down from their false gods. Uh, that's a huge victory. And I'm deliberately showing you this because I want you to see that you can have a huge victory in your life and still have a major hope problem. So then the Bible says that Ahab went up to eat and drink and Elijah went to the top of Carmel and bowed on the ground, put his face between his knees and prayed. And he did it seven times. Persistent prayer. He's, he's praying for there to be an abundance of rain because they had been in a drought for three years. Came to pass the seventh time. He sent his servant to go see if there were any clouds. Look toward the sea. And verse 44, it came to pass the seventh time. The man said, there's a sound as small, there's a cloud as small as a man's hand rising up out of the sea. He said, go up and say to Elijah, to Ahab, prepare your chariot and, and leave before the rain stops you. And so Ahab rode away, went to Jezreel where his palace was. And the hand of the Lord came on Elijah and he girded up his loins, ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Elijah ran and beat the king's chariot back to the palace. Now Elijah just had a huge victory on Mount Carmel. Now we get to chapter 19 and I want you to see why hope is lost. How could you lose hope after having a huge, great victory and seeing God work in such a powerful way. All right, watch. When, Eli when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me. If by this time tomorrow, I have not killed you just like you killed them. Wow. Elijah was afraid. Verse 3. He was afraid. And he ran for his life. Went to Beersheba, a town in Judah. Left his servant there. Then he went on alone. A day's journey into the wilderness sat under a solitary juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. He prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my forefathers, my ancestors. Take my life. Wow. Wow. What despair. Now, if Elijah really wanted to be dead, do you know what he could have done? <laughs> he could have just stayed there and let Jezebel kill him, right? So he's not even thinking straight. And when you lose hope, you don't think straight. Okay? When you lose hope, you don't think straight. See, Elijah was wishing he was dead, but he was not really wishing he was dead. You got to watch what you wish for. Heard a funny story about a couple that, that married couple that came on a wishing well. The wife leaned over, made a wish, and threw in a penny. The husband decided to make a wish too, but he leaned over too far and fell into the well and drowned. The wife was stunned, but she smiled and said, it really works. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, husbands. <laughs> you got to watch what you wish for. See, Elijah was wishing he was dead, but he was not really that, wishing that. And he became so distraught. Some, some Bible scholars think that he actually had a small nervous breakdown. Now, I want to show you 
Four, four things that caused this despair in his life. If you're taking notes, you should write these down, okay? Four things that caused this despair in his life. Number one, he had unrealistic expectations. He had unrealistic expectations. You say, what do you mean by that with Elijah? Well, Elijah thought that when there was a great victory on Mount Carmel and God answered by fire and the people said, oh, wow, the Lord's God, the Lord's God. He thought that everybody would repent then and get right with God and there would be a national revival. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. See, things didn't turn out like he thought they would because he had wrong expectations. We have to be careful in our expectations. They can lead to big discouragements in our lives. So you have to watch out what you're, what you are thinking and what you are expecting. In fact, here's a here's something that I learned years ago. If you really want to be happy in your life, what you need to do is you need to give all your expectations to God and expect nothing. I understand that that sounds tough and that's hard, but, but here's what I mean. If we give all our expectations to God, what we expect people to do for us and to us, and with, if we give all that to God, then, then here's why that's a benefit. Because then whatever you get, you can be thankful for. Because you weren't expecting anything. Right? Yeah. Wow. See, the problem is that the problem is we in our pride think, well, I deserve this and I deserve that. And I people should treat me better. And my husband or wife should treat me better. Or my kids should treat me better. Or my parents should treat me better. Or whatever. Okay, fill in the blank. We think that somebody should do better to us, with us, for us. And what we need to do is understand that God's the one we need to please. And God has one expectation of us. You know what it is? It's to be obedient, to be faithful. Paul said, one thing is required of stewards, that is that they're found faithful. So God wants us to be faithful to obey him. And so what we, we have to guard against unrealistic expectations. You're not responsible for what anybody else does. You're responsible for what you do. And by the way, as, as we're going to be reopening, uh, you know, officially next week and uh, asking people to do the social distance thing and if they feel like they need a mask to wear one and so on and so forth. And we have free masks available if people don't have one and need one. But listen, here's what's going to be a problem. The problem is that people look down their nose at somebody who differs with them on what the medical safe things are to do. That's a waste of time. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sending a letter out to the church family this week, and in the letter I'm going to tell them, look, we, are, we want you to be safe above all and comfortable, so if you don't feel safe and comfortable coming back to church yet, then don't come. That's simple, okay? Don't come. I'm not pushing people to come. We're going to keep on doing the live stream probably for the rest of our lives. Now, do I think that it, people need to be in fellowship? Absolutely, yeah. The Bible says, don't forsake the assembling yourselves together, of course. And, but, but we have to have people try to help people understand that it's not helpful for you to judge somebody else. In fact, let me explain it to you. You know why people usually judge somebody else and put other people down? This is bad, bad truth. But it's true, it's true truth about human nature. Most of the time, the reason people judge and put somebody else down is to make themselves feel better about themselves and their choices. That's right. So don't do that. It's just, it's counterproductive. It's not helpful, okay? It's hurtful. We just need to be obedient to God, do what God tells us to do. We have to be like the farmer, Sam Smith, that had the biggest water crop, watermelon crop in the county each year. Here's the true story. 
Someone asked how, how this man, this farmer, how he did it year after year. Had the biggest watermelon crop. All right, here you go. Here's your, if you want to know how to raise big watermelons, here's the secret. All right, here it is. He said, quote, I do everything I know to do to have a good crop. I spare no energy or cost. But when I have done all that I can do, I park my tractor under a large tree at the end of the watermelon field, and I say, God, I have done all that I can do, and now the rest is up to you. He did what he could. He said, okay, God, now I'm trusting you. And that seemed to work for him. Elijah had unrealistic expectations. Secondly, he focused on the problem. He focused on the problem. On Mount Carmel, Elijah focused on the power and greatness of God. But under the juniper tree, he focused on the power of the murderous Jezebel. See, if you look at the problem, guess what you're going to see? The problem, if that's all you're looking at. I like the way I, there's a devotional uh, that I have, a notebook called the 2959 Plan, and I remember this line from it. It's very good on this subject. It said, gaze at your problem, but put your focus on God. You can glance at the problem, okay? There's a problem. Yeah, I'm not, we're not saying that put your head in the sand and ignore it. Gl gaze at the problem, glance at it, but focus on God. See? Elijah focused on the problem. He also focused on himself. He focused on himself. He was in the depths of self-pity. There in verse 4, chapter 19, he went a day's journey in the wilderness, and he said, Lord, take away my life. I, I, I want to die. That's a discouraged man. The only thing you can think about is himself. And by the way, I do not mean any offense to, to anybody's relatives when I say this, but you need to understand that I want to try to help you if you have been a survivor of family members who committed suicide, all right? This is a truth that you need to know. When a person commits suicide, and there's probably people that are watching me right now who have thought of this, and maybe somebody here, but I want to I help you if you're a survivor. Here's what you need to know. When a person commits suicide, they're not thinking of you. They're only thinking of themselves and getting out of what they think is a hopeless situation. See, because survivors of suicide... The family, they always say, well, why, why did they do that to me? And it's hard because there's anger and there's, there's all kinds of regret. Maybe I could have stopped him if I'd done this. And, you know, maybe, why did they do this to me? Uh, you know, they're not thinking about you. I'm sorry. And again, I'm not trying to beat up on anybody. I'm just trying to help you understand that you should not beat yourself up if that happens. And, and it happens a lot, sadly, these days. You know, sadly, you know, I don't know what the stats are, but but suicide is really skyrocketing in our nation. That's because people have lost hope and don't have any purpose in their lives. If you want to help someone that's thinking of suicide, talk to them and give them purpose. Give them hope. That's what people need. Elijah focused on himself. Finally, he was physically exhausted. He was physically exhausted. That's another reason that people give in to dis depression and despair and discouragement. By the time Elijah got to Sinai, he was weak from fatigue, from all the activities that had gone on before. He was run down from the trip. So those four things that we find in his life are what caused him to lose all hope. He allowed his problem, Jezebel, to become bigger than the God he served. There's a good song, and I love, I love songs. I guess you've noticed that I quote them a lot in my, in my devotionals. There's a great song, Bigger Than All My Problems. God is bigger. See? Bigger than all my problems. God's bigger. God's bigger. See? We think sometimes that our problems are bigger than God. We need to be like the little girl. The little girl on her way home from church turned to her mother and said, Mommy, the preacher's sermon... Confuse me this morning. By the way, I don't ever want my sermon to confuse you. That's why I say, send me a text message with a question if you 
have a question about the message and I'll answer it, okay? Now, don't tell me to hurry up and, you know, get done because I'll ignore that. That reminds me of a pretexting day when, uh, when uh, preacher's wife was sitting in the crowd and she realized that she left the gas on their oven. And so she wrote a note and she gave it to the usher. She called the usher. She said she, she wanted the usher to go and give it to her teenage son who was, you know, in the youth room. He could drive. They didn't live far away. So the usher misunderstood her. He, she, the usher thought she wanted him to give it to her husband. So the usher walks right down while the preacher's preaching a sermon, right down to the, hands this note to the pastor. And if somebody's coming down here to give me a note, I'll reach down and take it. The pastor reached down and takes the note, opens it up, and the note read, go home and turn off the gas. <laughs> well, it's wrong, wrong destination for the message, right? The preacher confused me this morning. Why, why is that? The little girl said, well, he said God's bigger than we are, bigger than us. Is that true? Yes, that's true, the mother said. He also said that God lives within us. Is that true, too? Again, the mother said, yes. Well, said the girl, if God is bigger than us and he lives in us, wouldn't he just pop out through us? <laughs> well, that's what should be happening. See, she makes a point. If we're trusting in the Lord, see, our life will reflect it, won't it? Yeah. He's within us, and he's bigger than our problems. And we can say to the devil, greater is he that is in me than you, the one in the world. See, the devil wants you to feel hopeless. He wants you to think that God is not able to help you. That's not true. The devil wants you to think that God's going to leave you. No. The scripture says this, he will never leave me or forsake me so that I can safely say I will not fear what can man do to me. By the way, if a person just knew that verse in the Bible, Hebrews 13, 5, then whenever they feel alone, that they'd have to, they could just go to that verse and read it, say it, and defeat the devil. Now, we looked at why, why hope is lost. Let's also look at when hope is lost. When hope is lost, here's when it's lost. Hope is lost when we forget God. Hope is lost when we forget that God does not think the way we think and that God's ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, 8. And you should mark this in your Bible. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. See, there's two things that come into play here where God's different than we are. Two factors. First of all, the time factor. The time factor. It seems that time wears on hope like nothing else. Why is God sometimes slower than I want him to be? Sometimes I pray about things I know that are written in, within God's will, and then I wait, and I wait, and I wait. We like it when things happen fast, don't we? Did you hear about the man who went on a diet and wanted to lose weight? He went on a diet sometime back using Slim Fast. In two weeks, he only lost two pounds. He didn't like that. He said they ought to call the stuff Slim Slow. Say, wasn't fast. Wasn't fast enough for him. <laughs> well, God says, wait. We don't like it, do we? We don't like to go to the doctor's office. Have to wait. I found out the reason that they call people patients is because you sit there and sit there and sit there. You have to have some patience while you wait, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, no offense, Doc. <laughs> he's retired now, so he's you know he doesn't make people wait. I like doctors like the one who advertised that he gave flu shots through a drive-through window. He advertised it as a drive-by shooting. Drive-by. Shooting. <laughs> Nothing seems to wear on hope like time. The longer you wait, you think, man, it's not going to happen. But as we pray about some things, we need to consider God did not answer my prayer yesterday, but I hope that he will, I have hope that he will today. Now, you need to thank the Lord for 2 
Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some men say, but is long-suffering. He's patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but he wants everyone, all, to come to repentance. God can save anybody. Anybody. Now, if there's somebody you're praying for that you think it's a hopeless case, maybe you can get encouraged by this true story. This is a true story. You've never heard of this man because this, this gentleman was born in 1914. But here's the example of E. Howard Cadle. His mother was a Christian. His father was an alcoholic. His mother did something every night for him. No matter what she was doing at 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, this mother, she would quit what she was doing, get on her knees beside her son's bed, and she would pray for him. This was something she did every night. And when her son went down the path of sin, she began to pray more earnestly for him each night at 8 o'clock. It seems the more she prayed for him to come to know the Lord, the worse things got. By age 13, he was emulating his father, was drinking and out of control. Soon he was in the grip of sex and gambling and in the clutches of the Midwest crime syndicate. But her prayers didn't seem to slow him until one evening on a rampage, he pulled a gun on a man and squeezed the trigger. He wanted to kill the man. But the weapon never fired. And somebody quickly knocked it away. Cato looked across the room and he noticed that it was exactly 8 o'clock. And somehow he'd been spared from committing the crime of murder. But he kept on going headlong in this crime. Presently, his health broke. The doctor told him he only had six months to live. Dragging himself home, penniless and pitiful, he collapsed in his mother's arms, saying, Mother, I've broken your heart. I'd like to be saved, but I've sinned too much. This dear old mother opened her Bible and read Isaiah 118, which reads, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That morning, March 14th, 1914, and I was remembering his birthday wrong. This is his spiritual birthday. March 14, 1914, E. Howard Cadle was born again, started life anew. The change was dramatic and permanent. With Christ now in his heart, he turned his con man skills into honest labor and pursuits and started making money hand over fist. Gave 75% of it to God's work. He helped finance the crusades of the famous evangelist Gypsy Smith in which thousands were converted. Then he began preaching the gospel himself on Cincinnati's powerful WLW, becoming one of America's earliest, most powerful radio evangelists. He once said, until God calls me, I shall preach the same gospel that caused my sainted mother to pray for me. When I've gone to the last city and preached my last sermon, I want to sit at his feet and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me that dark and stormy day from a drunkard's and a gambler's hell. Wow. So don't get discouraged. Time can wear on our hope like nothing else. But God says in due time we'll reap if we faint not. Another thing that wears on our hope then is the fear factor. The fear factor. I don't know if you ever thought about this with Job, but you ever realize that Job, while he went through terrible things, he lost his reputation, his friends, his wealth, his health, the most devastating thing was through the terror of a devastating tornado, he lost all his children. And Job said in Job 3.25, For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. That was his greatest fear. It became a reality in his life. Fear can rob us of hope. Now, I'd like you to think about this. And this is not a pleasant you know, assignment, but think about this. What are your fears? What do you fear the most? See? Some people are afraid and have a fear of sickness. And while we're weak, tired, and suffering, you can count on Satan coming around and whispering words of, hopeless, words of hopelessness. Yeah, Satan will accommodate your fears. Satan will tell you, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're going to die. Yeah, you're not going to get any better. You're, it's, you're never going to get a job. It's hopeless. You're not going to get any money. You're not going to have a place to live. You're not going to do this. You're not going to. Satan will be happy to encourage you in your fear. But just remember this. The fear doesn't come from God. It comes from Satan. 
Here's a great verse for you to write down. I don't have it on a PowerPoint, but Psalm 56, 3. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, O Lord. That's what we have to do with our fear. When we are afraid, we need to put our trust in God. So we looked at why hope is lost and when hope is lost. So here's the conclusion, where hope is found. Hope is found in Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Did you ever see that? Second Timoth 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. The Lord Jesus Christ, who is our hope. Jesus Christ is our hope. Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the beginning of time. Now, the Holy Spirit showed me something I'd never seen before, and I've, I've quoted this verse probably hundreds of times, all right, in the last 50 years of preaching, but I, the Holy Spirit showed me something this week. It says there that God promised eternal life before time began. Think about that. Before time began. Before the creation of the universe. That's how much God loves you and me. And God doesn't lie. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. So here's my question to you. Do you have eternal life? Do you have eternal life? If you die today, do you know for certain you'd go to heaven? If not, then you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive your sins, and he rose from the grave so that he could give you eternal life. See, people need to know the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace, that's Jesus. Satan cannot rob us of hope unless we allow him to do it. If we focus on Christ and his power, we can have hope. Romans 5.1, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're justified by faith, and so we have peace. Not, not fear, not anxiety, peace and hope. John 14.1, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, John 14, 27. Matthew 11, 28, 29, come unto me, all you labor, heavy laden, burned down, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, I am meek and lowly in heart, you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now you say, okay, Pastor Bill, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I still don't have the same kind of hope that you're talking about. All right, here, here I, I anticipated that. And I want you to get very strongly this last point, okay? I want you to see that Jesus Christ is the living word, and he gave us the written word. So you have the promise of hope by the scriptures. Now, I, cannot over, I can't overemphasize this, all right? It's, I can't give this too much. I can't, all right? I should preach a whole sermon just on that point right there. If you don't have these verses marked in your Bibles, Romans 15, 4, and 13, you ought to mark them. Whatever things were written before, so that's, that's like stuff that happened in the Old Testament. Watch this. Was written for our learning, that we, through the patience and the comfort of the Scriptures, might have, what's the last word there? Hope. Through the perseverance and comfort of the scriptures, we can have hope. Verse 13, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you with completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll overflow with hope. And people will look at your hope-filled lives and they'll say, how can you be hopeless in the middle of the worst pandemic that the world's ever seen, that we've ever seen, we've never seen this before, and yet you're hopeful. How can you be hopeful? You know what you'll tell them? I know the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. 
God's Word. If I had a piano player here this morning, I'd have a sing as we close. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. See? Paid the price for all my sin on Calvary. For me, he died. For me, he lives. An everlasting life and light he freely gives. My hope's in the Lord. So don't lose hope, friends. Don't lose hope. Don't focus on the problem. Don't look at how bad the economy is. Don't look at what might happen. Just say, Father, I know you're in control. I know you're in control. I know you want me to be, be you sense, but I thank you that you're in control. I thank you that you will never leave me or forsake me. You've not forgotten your children. He never has, and he never will. Let's bow our heads and hearts together, please, for a closing word of prayer before we stand for our final prayer. If you're here this morning and or watching by video and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you don't have the hope of the gospel, then I invite you right now to accept Christ who died for you. He loves you, gave himself for you. You can do that with me right now. You can bow your head and pray this prayer just silently from your heart to God's. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. I accept him now, repenting of my sins, trusting in him as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me your child. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Help me now to live my life for you. In Jesus' name I pray. While their heads bowed and eyes closed, if you pray that prayer in a minute, God saved you. I'd like to thank you. If you're worshiping here this morning, you can lift your hand if you pray that prayer with me. If you're worshiping at home, I'd love to know about it so I can thank you and thank the Lord, send you some free literature that will help you grow. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we, through the comfort of the Scriptures, can have hope. I help people to see that the, the Bible is not like a magic, it's not a magic book, it's not a magic wand that you just wave it around and say, oh, I, I believe the Bible, so therefore I'm supposed to have hope. But I have a Bible, and I say I believe it, but I don't have any hope. Help people to understand that in order to get the hope that's in the Bible, they have to get into the Bible. If they want to get the hope that's in the Bible, they have to get into the Bible and read it and know it so they can know why they have hope and how they have hope through Jesus Christ. So help us, Father, to practice what we say we believe. And help us to not give up praying for people's salvation. Praying for America to have revival. Praying for abortion to end in this country. Praying for difficult, desperate situations. Help us to not give up. Help us to keep on praying. Praying for racism to cease. For love to conquer hate. And for America to be united, one nation under God. Help us not to lose hope, not to give up, because our focus is on you. We can look at the problems, but we can focus on you. And I thank you, Father, that you're in charge. We ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior, with thanksgiving. Amen. As I met, said in the message, I'll be sending out a letter this week to the congregation uh, just sharing about our official reopening uh, next Sunday. And uh, we're just asking people to use common sense. If, they're, if they don't feel well, don't come. And if they feel uncomfortable or not, not safe, then they shouldn't come. If people, some people will come and wear masks. Others will not. There's masks available at the door if people need them. Uh, we're, we'll ask people to just spread out. and We'll have more people here, so we'll just ask people not to sit right behind, right in front of somebody or not, not behind somebody. We're not gonna we're not gonna mark off chairs. I'm gonna just ask people to use common sense. All right, and I think we can do that. And uh, 
The other thing I want you to, to do is this. Don't, don't judge people who don't come, all right? In other words, everybody's got different medical conditions, different situations, so there's no judgment. And I want the people that are watching, and we're still on the air, I want those people watching to, to know that we're not pressuring anybody. Uh, we thank the Lord that we can minister through uh, the online uh, live stream, and we'll do that. In fact, we're, gonna, we're trying to figure out some ways we can do that through a lot of different platforms because not everybody's on Facebook. And so we're going to try to figure out, we're working on ways we can do it live through a host of different mediums at the same time. And it's at the same time that makes it difficult because we know how to do YouTube live and we know how to, but to try to put them all together. And well, our people are working on that. So uh, when, when we get that, uh, you know, something like that range, we'll let you know. And I believe that it'll just enhance greatly the outreach to more people. But let folks know that we'll be reopening. A lot of churches uh, reopen today. And uh, once again, uh, I've learned as a pastor, you can't compare your church to anybody else's church because everybody's different. Every church is different. Every church is different congregations, different needs. So uh, we are thank the Lord for the good people we have here. We had a 12-member team of our leadership team, eight people from our leadership team and four people from a medical team that put together the plan that we're, we believe we're comfortable with. And we'll put that plan out this week. We'll put it on social media so everybody can know about it. And we'll look forward to uh, next Sunday morning. Let's stand together now as we say the Lord's Prayer together. And please think about the words of this as you say it, because uh, especially what's God's will? What, is God, what does God want done on earth? See, think about that. Think about what God wants done. The only way to know, by the way, what God's, God wants done is what the Bible says, right? That's where God shows us his will. And so think about that as you pray. And think about the forgiveness part of this prayer. We, we often don't think of that, but we need to. All right? Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. You're dismissed.